Allô? Oui, allô, Isabelle, est-ce que tu m'entends? Oui, je t'entends parfaitement bien. Super, je vais te dire quelques mots au début en anglais, puis après ça, je te passe la parole. C'est très bien. OK. Très bien. Great. OK. Bon. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Um, thank you to the people who are connected on Zoom with us. Um, so we're here to discuss the findings of the report called Canadian Lithium Investments in Chile, Extractivism and Conflict. Um, three out of four of the authors of this uh, report are here with us today to talk about the report and the findings. And they will each have around 10 minutes or 15 minutes to talk. Um, and there will be a question period at the end. Um, I will give the mic to Isabel Orellana, who is the director of the Centre. Uh, Isabel is going to speak in Spanish. Soy Isabel. Mi turno. Mm -hmm. Bueno, eh, muy buenas tardes a todo el mundo. Bon, bonsoir. Uh, good evening. Es, eh, le agradezco mucho a Gabriel la posibilidad de saludarlos. Como él lo señalaba, mi nombre es Isabel Orellana y yo soy la directora del Centro de Investigación en Educación y Formación en Medio Ambiente y Ecociudadanía de la Universidad, Universidad de Quebec a Montreal. Soy responsable además del programa eh, del Diplomado de, de Estudios Superiores en Educación Ambiental. Y bueno, por otra parte, conjuntamente con, con Gabriel y un equipo, trabajamos en un proyecto que se inició en el 2018, eh, que tiene relación con la, las dimensiones crítica y política de la educación ambiental en los conflictos socioecológicos vinculados a la expansión del extractivismo. Por lo tanto, ya podrán constatar, digamos, la, la pertinencia que tiene para nosotros este, este foro eh, que aborda particularmente en la problemática de, asociada, digamos, a las la, inversiones canadienses en la industria del litio en Chile, que sabemos eh, se está expandiendo de manera exponencial, particularmente después de los acuerdos de París, que ha alertado una vez más sobre la situación de cambios climáticos y que en, en, en un cierto sentido ha abierto eh, la posibilidad a un mercado eh, de ajustarse y buscar nuevos, nuevas formas de, digamos, de mantener su, su poderío y de expanderse y en este caso, digamos, de... Eh, eh, digamos, eh, multiplicar sus... Eh, sus intenciones de, de, de proyectos con la perspectiva de extraer el litio y, y otros recursos, digamos, que son necesarios para un proceso de transición energética que está esencialmente centrado en la electrificación de transporte. Chile tiene, lo, como decimos nosotros, el, la, vive la, 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 la suerte que le da la maldición de la abundancia en minerales y es eh, codiciado, digamos, por muchos intereses y en ese sentido la, las regiones que, en las cuales se encuentra esta riqueza son particularmente afectadas, digamos, y tienen, viven la situación de riesgo y de amenaza de, de intervención de las grandes transnacionales esencialmente, pero de los grandes intereses extractivos con esta perspectiva, lo que significa una multiplicidad de, de impactos tanto en, la, en, en los periodos de exploración eh, como, por cierto, eh, durante la explotación y de impactos múltiples de, de diversa índole, no solo a corto plazo, sino que a mediano a largo plazo también. En todo caso, quisiera agradecer esta oportunidad de poder eh, tener con nosotros hoy día a Ramón Balcázar del Observatorio Plurinacional de Salares Andino, a David Holterman de Beyond Extraction y um, Viviana Herrera de Mining Watch uh, Canada, que van a poder eh, compartir con nosotros este informe que han realizado, que sabemos es el resulta de un esfuerzo eh, importante, digamos, de parte del equipo para poder dar cuenta de esta situación. Y una vez más, eh, Gabriel Poisson, agradecimiento, él es, es eh, estudiante de la maestría en Ciencias Ambientales de UCAM, de la Universidad de Quebec Montreal, y también asistente de investigación y coordinador del caso chileno en este proyecto que mencionaba anteriormente sobre los conflictos socioecológicos. Muchas gracias por darme la oportunidad de saludarlos y buen foro. Muchas gracias, Isabel. 
Eh, bueno, vamos a seguir con el, uh, sorry, we're going <laughs> to go forward with the land acknowledgement. Uh, so we would like to begin by acknowledging that Université du Québec à Montréal, UCAM, is located on unceded indigenous lands. Uh, the Kenyangahaga Nation is recognized as, as the custodian, custodians of the lands and waters on which we gather today. Geojage Montreal is historically known as a gathering place for many First Nations. Uh, today, it is home to a diverse population of Indigenous and other peoples. We respect the continued con connections with the past, the present, and future in our ongoing relationships with Indigenous and other peoples within the Montreal community. So I will um, present uh, the um, three co-authors of the report that we will discuss today, starting with Viviana Herrera. Uh, she is the Latin America Program Coordinator at Mining Watch Canada, where she works directly with Indigenous and non-Indigenous communities affected by Canadian mining. In collaboration with national and international networks, she coordinates advocacy campaigns to amplify communities' voices in Canada, advocating for corporate and government accountability. With a master's degree in international studies from the University of Montreal, Viviana has been involved in projects focused on the intersection of gender, human rights, and the extractive sector in Latin America since uh, 2016. From 2016 to 2019, she lived in Bolivia, where she worked as a researcher at a La Paz-based uh, research institute on multiple projects dealing with the socio-environmental impacts of mega hydroelectric dams in the Bolivian Amazon on indigenous communities. Uh, I will now present uh, Devin Holterman, who is a postdoctoral fellow leading a collaborative research project between the University of Northern uh, British Columbia and the Yellowstone to Yukon Conservation Initiative that looks to explore and develop the conservation social sciences across the Yellowstone to Yukon region. His broader research interests include the political, economic, and ecological dynamics of biodiversity, conservation, and the extractive industries, and the ways the two sectors intersect. Devin co-founded the Beyond Extraction Research Collective and has worked with various not-for-profit groups around the world. Now Ramon, Ramon Balcazar, is the coordinator and co-author of the report. Uh, he is the co-coordinator of the Plurinational Observatory of Andean Salt Flats, um, OPSAL, a cross-border collective that brings together Indigenous leaders, activists, and researchers from Chile, Argentina, and Bolivia around the protection of Andean salt flats and wetlands and lithium mining resistance. He is currently pursuing a PhD in rural development and his research focuses on the local implications of the corporate energy transition and green extractivism in the Indian uh, Puna. He produced the documentary, Water is Worth More Than Lithium, and edited the book, Salares Andinos, among other works in collaboration with local and international organizations. So we're gonna start with uh, Viviana Herrera and her presentation. Thank you very much for being here. Okay, one well, thing. Uh, so thank you so much. <laughs> I think we're mixing up French, Spanish, and English, uh, <laughs> but uh, this is uh, Montreal, so we're fine. Uh, so thank you so much for the presentation, uh, Gabrielle. Uh, I'm very happy to be here. Um, and yeah, so tonight uh, I'm gonna be talking about the, the push of uh, the push for mining uh, for the energy transition. Uh, how this translates into the global south in countries such as uh, Chile. Uh, and I'll try to outline uh, what some of the affected communities um, uh, in Canada are saying about mining projects for the energy transition, especially lithium mining. Uh, but first, I would like to introduce you to uh, Mining Watch Canada. So we at Mining Watch Canada, we are an Ottawa-based uh, organization. Uh, that works in solidarity with indigenous communities uh, and non-indigenous uh, communities who are dealing with the uh, potential or um, uh, actual industrial uh, mining operations. 
that are that are affecting their lives and territories, or with the legal uh, with the legacy uh, legacy of closed mines. Also, we uh, at Money Watch Canada, we work towards a world in which uh, indigenous uh, communities uh, can effectively exercise their right their rights to self determination, and communities uh, must consent before any mining project um, uh, may occur. Uh, we do all of this work by working um, with national and international coalitions and networks. Um, so to start, uh, I think it's very important to, yes, uh, it's very important to, um, uh, to say that Canada has a key position in the globalized uh, world um, in terms of the mining industry. Uh, nearly half of the world's publicly, pu publicly traded mining companies are listed on the Toronto Stock Ex Exchange. And the majority uh, of these investments, as you can see in the map, are uh, located in Latin America, in countries such as Brazil and Chile. And so all of this, um, as you may guess, um, means that the level of influence uh, that Canada exercises in countries such as Brazil, Chile, uh, and the others um, shown, shown in the map is very, is very significant. So before we get into what has brought us here, which is uh, Canadian uh, investments in Chile, uh, in the uh, lithium mining industry, I think it's very important to say, or to talk a little bit about why um, Canada is the capital of the uh, mining world. So first, uh, I would like to say, or one of the reasons why uh, Canada has such a prevalent role in the mining world is because of all the, la the laws, the regulations and tax systems that uh, are designed by and for the mining industry that allows the mining industry uh, to meet their own needs um, and pay little um, taxes uh, relative to their earnings. Also, we have a whole ecosystem of uh, experienced and skilled um, consultants, financiers, engineers um, that work uh, for the mining industry. Um, also, let's not forget all the political and economic support that um, Canadian mining companies enjoy and receive uh, by Canadian embassies, um, and especially by the trade commissioners, uh, whose job is to facilitate and, and promote uh, Canadian mining in other countries such as Chile. And of course, as you can see in the pictures in the, in the slides, um, we have this um, uh, legacy of, um, I mean, I mean, I'm sorry. This history of colonial um, uh, of co uh, colonialism in in Canada. We have a history of genocide, of displacement, of um, disposi dispossession of indigenous peoples, which is still continues uh, today. Uh, the history of Canadian uh, colonialism and the building of capitalism in Canada are intrinsically linked to the mining industry. Uh, and as such, this is a model that is exported to other uh, jurisdic uh, jurisdictions. Um, and as of now, uh, one of the uh, things that we're gonna be talking tonight uh, is this push for mining for the energy transition. And so we're again seeing this um, disposition and this displacement of indigenous uh, communities and communities uh, who are resisting this uh, push. Um, so uh, this mining for the energy transition is being pushed and is being advanced with two, uh, with many discourses, but one of those discourses is the, um, the need for a post uh, COVID-19 economic recovery, but also um, for to fight against uh, climate change. And that's something that I'm gonna discuss right now. So uh, one of the, um, now that we know that um, we are very concerned about the climate crisis, uh, corporations and governments are putting out there that the solution uh, to, the, to the climate uh, emergency is um, deepening uh, mining extraction. 
uh, that is to say, uh, intens intensifying the extraction of critical minerals and metals needed to build the technologies uh, needed for the energy transition. That, that means uh, that we need minerals and metals to, uh, for technologies such as solar panels and electric cars. That's what we hear in the news. That's what we hear when we see uh, min the Minister of Natural Resources addressing um, a climate change. Um, so in this way, uh, the same extractive model that has brought us to the current uh, climate emergency is being sold to us by governments and the mining industry as the solution to climate change. That is to say that we need to replace one type of extractivism with another one. In other words, that the fossil fuel industry, that we need to replace the fossil fuel industry with a so-called uh, green mining, uh, which actually has the same issues uh, as traditional mining, that is to say gold mining. Um, so that means uh, lack of consent from communities, human rights violations, and contamination of fresh uh, water sources. So how are governments and uh, the, mining, the mining industry um, positioning themselves as the solution to uh, the climate crisis? Well, we have, um, for example, the current Minister of uh, natural, uh, natural Resources, which, which was, who was also the Minister of the, the Environment and Climate Change, saying that um, climate change uh, is both the challenge of our time but also an economic, economic opportunity. Uh, the mining sector will play a critical role in supplying the minerals and metals for batteries needed uh, in a clean economy. Also, we have um, Sayona Quebec. Uh, Sayona Quebec is a Canadian company that is trying to push for lithium mining here in the province of Quebec. And as a way to present or to uh, get capital and investment from investors, um, they are painting this picture of um, uh, lithium to be uh, the, the solution to global war uh, warming. And we see this in their website and in their communications is literally uh, painted as green. Um, and so, all, of course, all of this call, calls into question Canada's priorities, right? Um, it makes visible this contradiction between a discourse um, uh, about uh, respecting indigenous rights, about respecting human rights, women's rights. Uh, however, when we see um, this sort of policies, we see that what drives Canada, um, a can Canadian public policies and foreign policies is actually economic and manic interest, uh, which are environmentally and socially destructive. So what are some of these public, public uh, policies that are driving uh, the, this push for mining for the energy transition? We have a, um, a few. So at the federal level, we have the uh, metals and minerals plan. Uh, at the provincial level, uh, many, uh, most of, for not to say all the provinces in Canada have their own plans. Uh, so here in Quebec, we have the Quebec plan for the development of critical and strategic minerals 2020-2025. But um, for tonight, and given the time that we have, I would like to highlight the last one. Um, and the reason for this is because no, it's not only the most recent one, it was announced in December 2022 during the COP15, which as you know, was uh, held uh, here in uh, Montreal. But as you know, uh, in December uh, at Palais Congrès, uh, Justin Trudeau well, was announcing um, more, uh, like a couple of um, initiatives in order to uh, reverse uh, biodiversity loss. And however, at the same time as Justin Trudeau was announcing these uh, uh, commitments to fight against uh, uh, the climate um, crisis, his Minister of Natural Resources was announcing this um, uh, strategy. And, this is very concerning um, because this um, strategy, Canada's critical minerals strategy uh, aims uh, to expand exploration uh, and speed up uh, all the regulatory processes uh, for uh, critical mining, cr critical mineral um, uh, projects such as lithium, graphite, um, cobalt, magnesium. In a biology, biology, 
biologically sensitive areas and where indigenous communities have already said that they, that they don't want mining. Um, so it's basically an adaptation of business as usual. And what it promises is to accelerate um, the literal bulldozing of indigenous rights. Um, and so also this goes in contradiction to what mining affected communities say. Mining affected, mining affected communities in Canada have been saying that they want uh, that the Canadian government regulates the mining industry. And what it, this strategy does is the total opposite. It's trying to deregulate the mining industry uh, for, uh, in, the name of, uh, the clim uh, to, in the name of fighting against uh, climate change. So uh, what are communities, uh, how are communities pushing back against um, this advancement of mining in their territories? So the current climate crisis uh, caused by the intensive uh, use of fossil fuels has the world um, and all of us very concerned, um, but particularly those communities that are, that are already suffering from climate emergencies. Therefore, the solution that proposed by mining affected communities is that we need a new paradigm shift, uh, that we need transformative solutions uh, instead of uh, finding technological solutions to the climate crisis, um, like electric cars. Um, and we see uh, a lot of talk about, you know, as I just mentioned, this uh, discourse about critical minerals and, and metals, but indigenous communities and indigenous and, and non-indigenous and, and non communities, they ask critical for whom and critical for what and at what social and environmental cost. And I think those are questions that we need to think about when we hear um, uh, these te technological solutions to the climate crisis. Uh, and also we need to be reminded um, or think about what are all of those metals and minerals needed for the technologies for um, the, uh, to mitigate climate change. Where are all of those minerals and metals coming from? They come from somewhere and they're affecting communities. Um, and so we need to take that into consideration uh, when we hear, um, you know, talk about uh, electric cars, for example. Um, so one of the places that, uh, as I'll just show in the previous slide, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, so this, these are some of the lithium projects um, uh, happening here in Quebec that are trying to be advanced against the consent of indigenous communities, but also the consent of um, uh, citizens um, committees. And some of them are on your right. Um, uh, we have the uh, Long Point First Nation, uh, which is currently opposing um, Sayona Quebec's uh, Tanzim uh, lithium project uh, because of its uh, environmental impacts, mainly uh, water contamination, but also because it's, uh, it could uh, profoundly, profoundly affect their livelihoods, um, such as um, hunting and fishing. Indigenous leader uh, Steve Matias from the Long Point uh, First Nation has explained uh, that this project will be located in a very sensitive area. And or he asks, uh, and I quote here, he asks, are we willing to sacrifice that sensitive ecological, ecologically area just for the sake of electric cars? Um, another group, uh, and so we, we see here on the right, um, this is a petition that they've launched um, a year ago. Uh, I believe there is, that they are still receiving uh, signatures and I would encourage you to uh, support this uh, in their fight against uh, lithium in their territory. On, their, on your left, you see a picture of the committee, uh, of the Citizens Committee for the Protection of the Esker. Uh, this is a committee um, here in Quebec as well that is um, mobilized against uh, Sayona Quebec's uh, Othier lithium project. Um, and they're mobilized because they want to protect, they are looking to protect their esker. The eskers are uh, one of the most pure forms of water uh, that we find here in Canada and it's actually located here in the province of Quebec. And so, and it's being threatened right now by lithium mining. 
Um, and I believe that Ramon, in his presentation, he's gonna expose the reasons why uh, lithium mining is one of the most uh, water intensive uh, activities and one of the reasons why communities are so concerned about lithium mining. I know that uh, I know that I went over time, so I'm gonna leave it there. And uh, but I'm very looking forward to our Q and A and continuing the conversation. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Viviana. Um, now Devin is next, and he will pre be presenting as of now. <laughs> I only speak one language, so no difficulties for me <laughs> today. Um, but yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks for those in attendance and those online, and also to Gabrielle for your support. And of course, Ramon and Viviana as well. Uh, Viviana, we actually just met tonight. So putting together the report and doing these things was all in this kind of crazy time of the pandemic and all of those other things. So. It's nice to finally meet you uh, and be together in, in this space to talk about some of this work. Uh, I'm a postdoctoral fellow at UNBC in British Columbia, um, and I work really closely with Yellowstone Tukon Conservation Initiative. Uh, but tonight I'm actually here in my capacity as a member of the Beyond Extraction Research Collective. Um, Beyond Extraction is a group of researchers, writers, activists, uh, artists, uh, from a range of disciplinary kind of backgrounds uh, and, and philosophical backgrounds as well. And we've really come together to kind of critically investigate um, and resist, you know, the resource extraction industries in its various forms. And we really, through this collective, we try to create venues and platforms for the voices, stories and struggles, and also the techniques uh, that confront the kind of imperial promises of industry and its extractive mode of, of social organization as, as we, we conceptualize it. Um, you know, our, our, the group's primary objective really is to reveal how the mineral exploration and development sectors of the mining industry, so kind of an, this rather often forgotten subsector of the mining industry, um, conjures this rather uh, imaginative or conjures an image of the sub of subterranean space as, as uh, a space of really um, dramatic private wealth, in effect. Um, and we began this work, let's say in 2020, a little bit before that, um, but thanks to, um, in large part, we, we came together around a, an Antipode International Workshop Award, which allowed us to host this Beyond Extraction Counter Conference in 2020, literally days before um, the pandemic changed everything for everybody. Um, and this counter conference was really like a multi-day series of events we held during this time. Um, and importantly, and why I'm talking about it is we held it concurrently to um, the Prospectors and Developers Association of Canada's annual convention, which is the largest mining conference in the world. And so this image you see here is just a few blocks from the Metro Convention Center, uh, where we were literally trying to counter the, 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 the convention um, commonly referred to as PDAC, which you'll hear me say a lot. Um, and so as a collective, we take PDAC, this convention and the industry association as our kind of primary node of analysis, if you will, um, uh, and critique. And we try to expose you know, this, the convention and the industry association as, as a key player in uh, the extractive industries and um, it, it, it's various kind of uh, the way in which the extractive industries function at international through kind of these international networks of relations and discourses and representations. So our focus and really our contribution to this, this work was in trying to reveal PDAC as this crucial node in uh, the Canadian and really international mining space. Just quickly a little bit more about uh, beyond extraction, um, you know, building from those initial efforts in 2020, we kind of, we didn't, we tried not to let the pandemic slow us down. Um, and in, you know, building off those efforts in 2021, we also hosted an online forum showcasing a very series of, of researchers who are very critical of the mining industry. Just last year, some of our members uh, launched a 
a audio and visual uh, counter tour of the Royal Ontario Museum's uh, tech suite of galleries, uh, which is also the, the Royal Ontario Museum in Toronto is also a, a key uh, partner with PDAC. And so we're trying, again, trying to reveal these kind of connections um, in, in, in various kind of social and, and cultural spaces that are tying back to, to kind of promoting or legitimizing or normalizing the, the, the mining industry and particularly Canada's kind of role in it. So you can, anyway, you can learn more about our work here, uh, the collective's work, all um, volunteers and such on our, on our website. Um, so I keep saying PDAC. And so what is PDAC? Uh, as I've said a couple times already, it's both uh, an association, it's an industry association and it's uh, of um, prospectors and developers, the subsection of subsector of the mining industry. And again, it hosts this very large um, and quite overwhelming uh, a mining convention in the world, uh, largest mining convention in the world in downtown Toronto each year. And as an industry association, which I think sometimes we forget, right? We hear about PDAC as a convention, as a conference, but it's actually an industry association, which lobbies really intensively to secure government support, some of which Viviana was kind of speaking to earlier, right? These federal and provincial policies that are in place and other supports that make Canada so such a, a, a kind of appealing space for the extractive industries. And they really look to, you know, well, let's be blunt. They, they look to create as, as weak of a regulatory environment for its members as is possible. And, and again, those members are the companies that are engaged in the exploration and development space of, of the mining industry. And that, I think if we pull that out a little bit more, yes, those members include, include the kind of global giants of the mining industry, the Barrick Golds, or whatever they call themselves now, Barrick, I think just, and, and, and others. Um, but it also includes a very large number of very small exploration companies and very small development companies, which, you know, their main purpose really is to find some sort of lucrative deposit somewhere on, on, the, on the latest mining frontier and flip it to one of these larger companies that will actually pursue it uh, in the longer term. So it's really kind of a, I tend to think of this as a little bit of, you know, that Russian, <clears throat> Russian roulette wheel, right? Like you're kind of just gambling in some ways. Um, I think one last thing I'll say here too is it's in, important to, to help us kind of ground the size and scale and the extent to which the this subsector of the mining industry functions or operates at. And, and to do so, it's it's always nice. And we bring this up as in our conversations with Beyond Extraction all the time. And, and to, to kind of reflect on this really well recited industry statement that said that that circulates in the mining industry, and you find this on all their websites. This is actually from I found this site, I wanted to get the numbers right. So I looked on the Ontario Mining Associations thing. And it's actually that um, only one in every 10,000 exploration projects becomes a viable mine. So for each mine that we saw on Viviana's maps earlier, or that we know are in existence, on average, there is 10,000 exploration projects that have taken place before that to, um, to get to this one mine. Uh, conceptually, uh, so we've, we, do, we have done research at PDEC, at the convention itself, and conceptually we're really inspired by, you know, um, scholarly investigations uh, of, that look at events and um, large kind of spectacular groups of, of, of individuals, conventions and such, and the kind of activist political interventions that highlight those types of events as, as really key areas at facilitating the continuation of an economic system that is really predicated on the exploitation of both um, labor and, and nature. Uh, and PDAC for us is really the site where mining industry lobbyists, executives, and employees mingle with government representatives, mining suppliers, academics, think tanks, financiers, obviously, investors, and, and try to stake their claim to, to the next um, the next big find, whether that's real, realized or speculative. And I have to say, you know, I love this photo because it's kind of above and, you know, we were there 
a few years ago and, and some of us have been a few times and you know walking through PDAC is really like taking this kind of wondrous journey through this really spectacular world of the mining industry and um, I think I have it on here yeah great <laughs> I'm laughing, but it's really not funny. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's really this spectacular view into the mining industry. Um, I'm kind of traumatized, I think, that's why I'm laughing. But, uh, you know, it's loaded in, on the bottom, I guess that's your left. That's these kind of propaganda list um, tours of school age children, um, you know, who are presented with all sorts of materials, including coloring books and various languages about, you know, the benefits of mining um, and, and such, these activity books. You know, there's also this kind of uh, trade show where you can go and see these really futuristic robotic suits made to like um, uh, measure the biometric readings of miners who are deep below the ground, right? So we can, the, the companies can tell if they're about to fall asleep or if they're stressed or these types of things. Um, and, and, <laughs> and on the far right here, you also have, this was after a panel um, that was linked to the critical minerals, mineral strategy in 2020 at PDAC. And this was actually a panel about talking, talking about Canada's investment in mining outer space. So it's really a, a kind of, um, it's both a trade show, it's mixed with this thing called the investors exchange and this plen uh, plenary, uh, including this session on mining space that, that leaves you really um, kind of bewildered, to be honest. Uh, I hope this works. And then, of course, you know, to kind of bring it back to what we're trying to talk about today, of course, the environment is featured really predominantly in, in PDEC and has, has been over the last number of years for sure. Um, and I would be happy to talk about the ways in which these environmental narratives are crafted at PDEC, whether it's from um, industry and, and, um, and governments talking about how mining is crucial for biodiversity mitigation efforts, um, the new life for nuclear uh, to fight uh, climate change. And, and also of course, these kind of endless celebration of corporate social responsibility and environment and social governance uh, principles and programming, et cetera. But really I, I wanna focus a little bit today on, on climate change because that's what the report is about. And, and again, PDAC is really this prime location for, for this discussion of as Viviana was mentioning, also uh, you know, present at COP15 and, and certainly present at PDEC, but this role that the mining sector can play in, in combating climate change, whether that's through emissions reduction strategies of certain companies, whether that's through electrif electrification plans at the actual site of the mine or throughout their operations. Um, you know, these companies at PDEC are often talking about or vying for this position to be the kind of most sustainable mining corporation, which of course, for many of us is kind of a contradiction in terms, but that doesn't really matter at PDAC. Uh, <laughs> um, and to me, and what we brought into the report was what's really striking is perhaps this, how the response to climate change um, is really crafted as a sales pitch from our elected officials, um, including Prime Minister Trudeau, who, I believe is the um, the prime minister to visit PDAC the most as a sitting prime minister. Um, and during 2020, I think he gave a very, just an absolutely spectacular example of how Canada's approach to climate change resembles really the approach to the foundation of this nation, right? This idea of just, as Viviana said various times, much more better than I will, but really just, you know, um, extracting the we resource wealth, natural resource wealth from the indig from indigenous peoples in this country. And I'm hoping this works. We didn't test, test the audio. Yes.
should have left the part going in French. But anyway, so you know, this is an example. And, and later in the speech, again, that was at PDAC um, in 2020. And later in the speech, the prime minister goes on to say how you know the Canadian government is this key partner for the mining industry. Um, and, and really highlighting, again, the government's critical mineral strategy that Viviana mentioned and its action plan that was launched under, the Trudeau, under Trudeau's leadership and you know, that, we, that we highlight in, in and throughout the report and have spoken to a little bit uh, today as well. And this for us, I, you know, I just wanna really emphasize this, this part of the quote, right? It's, it's predominant, oh, you can't see it there, but it's profit that comes after, but <laughs> um, uh, that's funny. Um, it's really this emphasis on profit right, uh, for, for, for us as, as critics of this space. And, and um, you know, this is what brings us to ideas around green extractivism, um, which we talk about in the report and, and elsewhere, and many others have done so as well, including uh, Theo Rio Francis, who I quote here on the thing, uh, on the slide, who, you know, defines green extractivism as the subordination of human rights and ecosystems to endless extraction in the name of quote, solving climate change. And, you know, I think this speech from Trudeau and various kind of interactions at PDAC and, and elsewhere are, are perfect examples of this. And I just want to emphasize that um, not only is this is green extractivism about the subordination of human rights and ecosystems as a means to save solving climate change or so-called, but it's also a, a, a way to, um, uh, uh, generate significant private profits. So it's not just about fighting climate change, of course, right? That's the narrative, that's the discourse. It is about driving significant private profits for individual investors or institutional investors, and of course, for executive compensation as well. Um, and so, you know, co-authors and I in the report have really tried to show how PDAC represents one of these key spaces where green extractivism kind of percolates. Its core ideals are promoted as, again, this the way out of the climate crisis. And really in stark contrast to this, um, uh, um, wait, I lost my part. In stark contrast to this and the profits to be generated from the mining industry and its investors and for its investors and executives, absent, of course, are the voices and the work of civil society organizations, solidarity groups, and indigenous and frontline communities, uh, who face, of course, the brunt of the challenges, both in terms of combating climate change, but also in terms of confronting uh, global extractive industries as well, whether it's in Canada or in places such as Chile, which uh, we, we focused on in this report. And so we, in including PDAC in this report, on Canadian lithium investments in Chile as a kind of key node in the function of this um, political economic system. You know, we tried to emphasize just how absent these voices and concerns are from or illustrate from the minds of the partnerships and, and approaches that are promoted by industry and government officials at places like PDAC. And green extractivism for us is really like rooted in these spaces, in this kind of spectacular event that is PDAC uh, and the neatly crafted narratives of our elected officials and the policies of the various layers of, of colonial governments, again, that Viviana highlighted earlier. So just finally, um, from beyond extraction's point of view, we see this space, again, PDAC, and it's kind of, you know, um, um, it's all the, the, the kind of networks that are associated with PDAC as well, as one where we must focus our critical energies to highlight their contradictions and, and illuminate these kind of rather ridiculous claims um, about, you know, green energy transition and these types of things. And so we've tried to do this a, a little bit in the report. And we also, you know, emphasize keeping our eyes on the spaces where these policies and approaches manifest where mining officials from all over the world strike deals in the heart of downtown Toronto and where Canadian companies start trouble and not the good kind in their search for uh, really imaginative wealth like I believe Ramon is gonna talk about now in Chile. So thanks.
Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Devin. Uh, now the mic is going to Ramon. Go ahead. Okay. <clears throat> thank you. Uh, thank you, guys. Um, <clears throat> sorry. Um, I'm very happy to be here again. Actually, uh, this uh, this work um, is also part of the connections and relationships uh, built uh, during PIDAC in 2020. Um, I actually attended the counter conference organized by Beyond Extraction. We've been working together since then, actually. Um, but uh, we were also um, collaborating with Mining Watch Canada. And that's how actually this report actually, or the idea of this report uh, was born. Um, as uh, Devin said, it, it's like, uh, we could call it a pandemic project. So it's also um, a show, a demonstration of uh, resistance in uh, probably one of the hardest uh, times that we've ever lived. Uh, some of us were also going through uh, sickness and hard moments during the production of this, this report. So I think it's very interesting also to, to, uh, to understand uh, how it, uh, we, we made it, no? Uh, it wasn't easy, actually. But uh, yeah, but uh, yeah, also like uh, maybe one of the, the your last slides, uh, Devin actually show uh, the other side, right? We, we analyze uh, these organizations, these networks, we analyze what Canadian and Chilean governments do, but we also have the capacity to organize ourselves and to build uh, other narratives. Uh, and also to, to act according to, to what we believe in. So what's interesting uh, about PIDA, actually this is also like intrinsically uh, self-ethnographic, I'd say, because uh, we were there, uh, actually I witnessed um, the, the speech and uh, the presentation made by Abobaldo Procuriza, the man in this picture, was uh, Presidente, ex, uh, former President Piñeras, uh, Minister of Mining, uh, during what they call Chile's Day, <laughs> so it's like a, it's like a real like a, I don't know like how you call it in English like the cattle uh, fairs when you go to to sell your cows and you know it's basically something like that. Um, but what is funny uh, it's that what they came uh, to do uh, in in Toronto at that time um, during actually social unrest in Chile and all the the uh, police repression and human rights crimes uh, were occurring. Actually, the many protests also were occurring in, in, in PIDAC, not only against PIDAC itself, but also against the Chilean government. It's, um, it's uh, the promise to foreign investors, especially Canadian investors, actually to create a national company of lithium. So foreign uh, investors could associate with the government of Chile, with the state, so they could exploit lithium uh, in a much easier way, right? Uh, what it's, uh, what it's, well, again, funny, sad, we don't know like how to call this uh, kind of situation is that under a progressive government, what it calls itself actually the, the first ecological government of Chile, Gabriel Boric, actually recently, 2023, uh, the subsecretary of mining came actually to make the same premise. So we wonder whether uh, actually um, right-wing uh, governments actually uh, and progressive governments actually are very different when it, when it comes actually to extractivism. Apparently not. Actually, um, the country, the government of, uh, Gabriel Boric is about to release the, the national policy of lithium and uh, the creation. Of, I mean, we are not 100% sure, but it's probably what, what's going to happen. I think with the creation of this, actually the company under these conditions to offer actually joint ventures for foreign companies. From the perspective of uh, land uh, and territory defenders, actually the situation will become more complex with this progressive government, the president that we voted for actually, 
because now the projects actually will have the, the permits and the concessions in a much faster way than before, than ever before. Um, this is in the report. Uh, I think that it's part of what um, Viviana also explained. We are not saying that uh, what happens in Chile doesn't happen in Canada, for example. Uh, dispossession of uh, rural indigenous peoples actually happen also in the global north. Um, it's happening also in Europe. Um, it's happening in Portugal, in Spain, in Serbia, for example. Um, so these are uh, the, the lithium boom actually is affecting uh, different territories and uh, territories that have a lot in common. And actually Canada and Chile have much more in common than we thought probably uh, before meeting and, and even myself before coming to Toronto and now coming to Montreal, right? Um, but um, of course, uh, what I want to share here is more about what's going on in Chile. So um, uh, I think it's important to, to understand that all this, uh, the possibility or all the new projects that are coming um, uh, are, uh, are coming not only after a, a series of Canadian projects, especially in metal mining, uh, with this, with Barry Gold and Pascualama, for example, uh, with these very big cases, uh, Tech and many others. Um, but uh, Vizcachas, Proyecto Vizcachas, right? In Putaendo with copper mine, uh, mining, but but also in the salt flats with, uh, with conflicts already um, going on since several years. So in the case of the Salar de Atacama, which is the place that I've been living in and from, from where actually I work and I, I dedicate uh, my, my own activism and, and, and research since the beginning at least, because now it, it's, it's much more than Salar de Atacama, unfortunately. Um, we had uh, already uh, conflicts uh, between uh, local communities and uh, two main projects, lithium projects, uh, which are SQM and Albemarle, but I'm not going to explain everything here. Um, this is the second time that I used this picture only because I was part of, of this process. Here we are denouncing SQM and Rodwood Lithium, which is now called Albemarle. And, um, what I want to show here uh, is that actually the, these conflicts uh, that emerge under the signature of an agreement between the states and the, one of these uh, companies, and then after during uh, the social outbreak in 2019, right before actually um, uh, the time that I came to, to Toronto actually, uh, at some point um, were suffocated by negotiations and by new strategies used by companies and um, doing what uh, the Observatory of Latin American Conflicts, OLCA, calls uh, the privatization of dialogue. So now it's the companies actually, uh, the, the ones who deal directly with communities. This has a lot to do, well, we don't have much time to analyze that, but also a lot to do with what I saw in the, you know, the indigenous people's uh, space in PIDAC, at PIDAC, and this model of relations with communities and how communities are now partners of the, of the mining companies, right? So this is pretty much what has been going on in Chile. And it's a model actually of relation that has been uh, also established as the new norm, as well as the compensations, uh, mostly uh, for lithium and copper projects. But this happens, of, of course, uh, we, in a context, historical moment. Um, and uh, what, we, what we see here is the absence of the state or a, a role as like the role uh, lack, lacking uh, of services, of basic services, water, electricity, healthcare, but present for facilitating extractivism or for repressing demonstrations, for example. So in Chile, a lot of people say, no, the, the state is totally absent. I wouldn't say that. I said it's absent for some things, but very present for others. Um, and also like um, with um, also like emerging um, or more relevant role of mediators, uh, mostly in the NGO sector, but also in the academia as validators of the discourses of imposed 
by mining corporations, such as sustainable mining, responsible mining, corporate social responsibility, and so-called governance, which nobody knows what it means, but, but it's very popular and uh, very much um, appreciated by corporations. Um, and uh, lithium mining happens uh, under very uh, specific conditions, uh, thinking that um, the high Andes are one of the most vulnerable, actually, uh, ecosystems uh, to climate change in the world uh, because of the altitude, because of uh, actually the dryness, because of the change in temperatures. But the, there is also like a very particular infragile conditions that are being also uh, affecting local communities. Here, uh, an Opsal comrade, uh, also an indigenous uh, activist and farmer, is actually seeing what happens in uh, his ancestral territory with the floodings uh, and also the destruction of the irrigation canals. And this is more, mostly part of, um, it, it is part of the report and it's something that I go much deeper on in my, in my research because all, all these are um, actually agricultural systems that exist since millennia and are being rapidly destroyed by climate change. So this uh, territory is not, not only have to face green extractivism but also the consequences of uh, phenomenon, uh, phenomenon that they didn't cause actually. That's actually most of countries in the global south, like, like Chile actually didn't cause with our contribution to climate change in historical and present terms are, uh, is marginal actually. But we are supposed to sacrifice ourselves to save the planet, of course, <laughs> because lithium is important. So um, there is a lot of information in the report. Actually, the report is very informative, I think. Um, there is a lot of information that we could actually update and, and add, of course. It's never enough, but uh, for these presentations, I'm just gonna use uh, one case for uh, each salt flat that is currently affected by Canadian lithium investments, just as the title, just as the title of this presentation. So we have uh, this uh, wealth minerals. Wealth minerals was a Pirac, actually. I interviewed them. I, I talked with them. Of course, they told me like a totally different story. <laughs> um, but what, what in, what's interesting is that this company is actually trying to establish in the same salt flats that I already shown, actually where the two big companies have already been there for decades and that uh, actually have faced all these uh, conflicts and other negotiations and so on. So what this company is, is, is facing, it's actually, it's a very hard uh, landscape to establish. Why? Because the, the, the local communities have already a lot of, of power and experience. So they are already, uh, they accepted the, the already ongoing projects, but they don't want new projects. So Wealth Minerals is actually having a very hard time. It's not what they told me actually. For them, they had like a, all of the consent, good, super good relations with the communities. But here we have like a quote uh, from Sergio Cubillos. He is uh, the former president of uh, an indigenous association, which is, I'd say that the main representation um, um, institution, uh, indigenous institution in Salar de Atacama. And in the, in the report, you can also find uh, more information on how actually they try to approach the communities and their strategies, how they try actually to seduce and negotiate and to promise something very interesting to change this extraction model. Uh, Viviana actually said something about it. This is actually, uh, these are the evaporation ponds. And this is one of the main sources of conflict because uh, water uh, lithium mining is water mining in the salt flats. So you, what you see here is just the surface, but the brines actually are extracted from underground and then evaporated. So there is a huge loss of uh, water through evaporation, plus all the fresh water that is used for the process. And in the case of Atacama salt flats, all the water that is used by copper mine, which is actually probably uh, the, the largest impact actually comes from copper mining. So we also need to see this in an aggregated uh, form, let's say, to analyze the impacts of mining. But of course here, like the, the main, the focus is on lithium mining, but I just want to be very clear 
uh, the fact that it's not the only impact actually existing. And the problem is that the evaluation of the projects and all, or most of the analysis actually uh, on the situation um, isolate whether lithium mining from copper mining or one project from another. And that's actually one of the main problems is, is something that actually we, we try to change. Uh, so basically uh, one of the premises I just needed to, to choose one quote, but you can find it in the report, is how actually uh, wealth minerals is promising that they will not use this method. They have no proof about it, of course. And there is no actually proof that what they promise is like a direct lithium extraction, uh, DLE actually, will actually work or will be, or we have no impacts since it's, it's not a proven system. Actually, there is a lot of also um, scholarship about it. and. You can also find it and it contradicts actually the claims from the companies who are promising so uh to local communities and even to the government actually hey you don't need to worry about it because we understand that this is a problem so we come with this solution and the solution of course is always within the same uh extractive or extractivist actually uh, logics and we have also maricunga salt flat this is um a salt flat that is well, for, for the north of Chile, you could say it's close, but it's a couple of hundreds of kilometers south from Atacama Salt Flat, and it's mostly inhabited uh, by Koya indigenous communities. Uh, and here we have the Bering Lithium, which is one of the partners of Proyecto Blanco. This is a project that actually was approved already by the Environmental uh, Authority, but without uh, carrying uh, indigenous consultation, as always. Um, and this also has to do with, I spoke about before, with the privatization of dialogue. So what they do here is actually what they did here uh, was to choose actually the, or the communities that, that would agree with negotiating with, uh, with the company. So they signed a private agreement and that's how actually they got the approval for the project. So Leslie Munoz, uh, another comrade from Opsal and an indigenous Defender, uh, she, uh, she, her mother, her community are against lithium mining under like any condition. So they don't want to negotiate. Uh, as a result, actually, they've been excluded from all this dialogue. So the, the, the project actually can carry on without them. So they are invisible for the state and that's their struggle right now to be present and to actually be acknowledged and recognized as a community that is protecting the, the salt flats, the wetlands, the environment, regardless the decisions of the other communities that are, are respectable and understandable, but they also have the right to be consulted. Of course, I cannot go too deep uh, into this case, but you can also find uh, more information uh, in, the, in the report. Uh, we've been also publishing some, some more updates about this case, if you're interested, on our website, uh, is salares.org, uh, uh, because it's a, it's, a, it's a very dynamic case, actually, the one of uh, Maricunga. And this is the last case that I want to share. Um, I think it, it's okay with the time. We still have some time, right? Um, this is um, a salt flat, uh, which is in the Tarapacá region. It's in the border with Bolivia. It's uh, towards, let's say, north of Atacama salt flat. And it's a salt flat that probably 95% of the salt flat is in Bolivian territory. But since in Bolivia, they have their own laws and it's complicated for foreign investment so far. Uh, they, some companies like Lithium Chile, which is not Chilean, is Canadian, is super Canadian, 100%, actually. Uh, this is a condor, by the way. This is a symbol, like, uh, you know, it's like the bald eagle for mm. the neighbors. Mm. So the condor is for us, mm. basically. Uh, so yeah, so it's very ironic. Um, what they, what they, what they try, trying to do actually is to explore. And, and this is connected with uh, one of the findings of this report. And then, and, and actually what, what's, what's actually, what really matters about this. Um, so they want to explore. So these are uh, the Aymara indigenous communities opposed to the exploration world uh, because it's where they feed the cattle, uh, mostly, uh, well, they, they actually, they grow uh, quinoa and they keep uh, mostly alpacas. 
alpacas are in the very high, high, in the plateau, let's say. They live uh, high in the higher lands, which is these lands. Um, so what, they, what, what happened with this, uh, with this, in this case, is that the Lithium Chile actually uh, filed a lawsuit against the com two communities, two, two indigenous communities. And who needs, to, who needs to actually to respond is the president because he's the legal representative of the community. And uh, Maria Gomez actually, uh, this, is, this is a quote from the report, uh, but we, we had like a talk last week and she still has to go to court and to keep responding to the requirements. And the, the situation is being changing a little bit uh, because fortunately um, the, state, uh, the, the court actually recognized uh, the right of her community to be consulted, even for the exploration, which is something very new because normally exploration works happen like in silence or they just hide or they don't ask anybody. So this is changing because there is much more experience and with the networks help. Actually now, unfortunately, um, Paulina, um, a member of our team, she's, she's an attorney and she's um, also like following the case and you know, so we are also like building more capacities, internal capacities to, to like contribute more like in a more concrete ways to this process. But uh, <clears throat> something that I really wanted to do is like to show who is this person. Uh, so take notes, <laughs> please, because I, it's Terran Walker, a highly experienced geologist and leading expert in hydrogeology from Canada, of course. So he directly, as you can see here, is uh, the demandante, is the, the person mm -hmm. who is actually um, filing the lawsuit against the community. It's not even the company, it's this person itself. Why? Because people like this man, actually, what they do is to go to Chile, they find the lithium, and what they do is to come to PIDAC and other spaces, like similar spaces, to sell the projects. So they, when they find it, they sell it to junior companies and so on. You know, on junior companies sell it. This is something that we also learned in PIDAC, right? Uh, uh, so it's very, uh, for me, for example, and part of my, my, my research actually now focuses much more on this kind of, uh, you know, organizations and people, because um, sometimes uh, when we, um, work too much on describing the resistance and organizations and what's going on in the territory. We don't know who's using this information and for which purpose. And uh, we've realized that many of these companies and, this, and even the government actually, sometimes uh, they use a lot of information that is published sometimes by critical uh, researchers, even by NGOs and even by the, um, by the communities themselves sometimes. So we prefer actually to keep some of uh, the internal or even personal information that from the indigenous activists and the territories, uh, sometimes uh, just for, you know, for the record and to make uh, better, better decisions, uh, but not to reveal much about what's going on, especially now with all the new projects coming over us, like, you know, as a, as a big tsunami of uh, lithium projects, but we need to expose this person, uh, these people. We need to expose the governments, of course, and all the networks, right, that work in favor of, uh, to favor extractivism. So <clears throat> Maria also has like uh, her own vision of the transition and the electromobility. And I don't think that it's that different from mine or from yours probably, or from many people's. Um, she really asked why people actually want, these people want more and more money and at, at which cost. And this is something that, that we hear uh, actually all the time with people who from the territories, they don't understand what's really going on because this is a crisis that they didn't provoke. This is a project or extract, a big extractivist project that they haven't been actually asked about. And, uh, and I think that this, uh, these voices are key actually to, to, to build these other narratives, right? With them, not only uh, uh, asking them what they think, but work with them 
Uh, that's that's actually Opsal. That's why we call it like a dialogue of knowledges more than just research. So basically the, the, the findings are basically what, uh, it's what you just said, how Canada, how these initiatives, how PDAC, right? Contribute actually to capitalize the, into a deep and extractivist uh, development model in countries like Chile, uh, but also countries or our, our president or our authorities also are part of these networks and they are thinking the future of these countries, of our countries, also within the, the framework, right, of extractivism. Um, the new projects, the salt flats, the increasing number of, of projects, um, and how these community relations strategies change depending on the context, on how or what's the response that they find with the communities. They will offer agreements, they will offer help, they will uh, file lawsuits. It's, it's going to change. It's going to depend on what's the response. But what, but they they will, they will actually pursue and they will actually do uh, whatever is uh, at uh, the reach actually to get what they want, which is uh, the lithium water and and the access actually to the territories. Um, and the responses, I think this is very important. I mean, we cannot just uh, stay or stick to, to this, um, uh, to, the, to the analysis of the situation, but we are also acting, we are organizing ourselves. We are connecting South, North and also uh, South, South, especially South, South actually, uh, dialogue. That's why Opsal, uh, we are organized uh, among territories in Chile, Bolivia, Argentina, territories that were separated, there were wars, there were so many divisions, and it's the case everywhere. Uh, but we actually, we don't call it lithium triangle for the same reason, it's the Puna de Atacama, or whatever you want to call it, uh, except <laughs> lithium triangle. Because <laughs> um, and, uh, and yeah, so this, this is the way we actually not only fight uh, the projects, but we also fight the mindset actually that is behind green extractivism. Um, yeah, I think that's it. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Ramon, for the presentation. Um, we would be at the question period right now. If anyone in the room has questions or if you are listening to us on Zoom and you have questions, you can either ask them yourselves or you can write them in the chat and I will read them out loud. Uh, Isabel has a question here. Podrían hablarnos sobre el tema. Can you please talk to us about the uh, matter of uh, protected areas in relation with the expansion of the lithium in industry or uh, extractive industry in general? Who would like to answer? It's the only question? Or... For now, yeah. Uh -huh. Well, in the case of uh, the extraction sites, I don't know if there is something to say about it in Canada or from, from Chile. Okay, yeah. Um, thank you, Isabel. Uh, yeah, it's a very good question. Actually, uh, today, uh, the current projects are next to protected areas. Um, we have like the Reserva Nacional of Flamencos in uh, Atacama Salsat, for example, uh, but even the, the protected area is actually um, divided into pieces that are spread all over the territory. So it's like, a, it's not as if, as if the basin was protected, it's only some spots. So that's a problem, right? Um, but uh, the hydrological systems affected are protected, for example, by the Ramsar Convention. Uh, in the case of Maricunga, we have a national park, it's uh, Nevado Tres Cruces, and so on. So actually there is um, an article in the book that uh, we published in 2021, written by Gabriela Burdiles, that actually uh, compares the regulation uh, in terms of protection of uh, Indian wetlands and exploitation of salt flats. So she, she makes this, this comparison and basically 
it's uh, is, is insufficient, totally insufficient. Even the, the, the fact that the projects are found in what it's called in Chile, the indigenous development um, areas, ADI, Areas de Desarrollo Indígena, is not sufficient. Uh, we have also um, other uh, regimes of protection. And unfortunately, actually, um, I don't know, Isabel or people in Chile must know, now with the discussion of the law that creates the service of biodiversity and protected areas, actually uh, in, the, in the Congress, uh, the, some, some of the commissions, some of, some of the, uh, the, the, the representatives, right, deputies, um, for example, um, they uh, took some articles out of, of the law, uh, actually to allow extractive projects to be actually authorized uh, and mining concessions to be to be possible even within these protected areas. So I think I think the, the current situation is insufficient, and what we think is the best um, uh, like future scenario possible, which is this 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 uh, service of biodiversity and protected areas, uh, is still actually uh, to be uh, to be voted uh, in in the slats version. So we're very concerned actually about it, uh, and it's probably something that we really need to work uh, on definitely. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Yes, it's Gabriela Bordiles de FIMA. It, it's the book. Uh, I can, we can share it. Actually, if, uh, if anybody wants to, to download the PDF, um, I can share it actually um, in, uh, on the chat. Yeah. Uh, I just, uh, is this how I close the? Yeah. yeah. Okay, great. Um, maybe we can go back to the first slide. I'm not sure. We're just here. Uh, would anyone in the room have a question? I had some prepared somewhere, but I lost. Just have a follow up for that uh, protected area. Uh, the, the, the Yeah, the protected area designation to uh, allow uh, exploitation. Is the protect are the areas protected against exploration? Is there a protection against exploration? If they can jump all the way to exploitation, and they have to know that there's a it's done exploration in those areas. Good question. Um, it's not only about mining, so exploration, it's not, it's a very specific to mining, right? Right. Uh, I, I think that exploration is included in productive activities. In extra, actually, then the word they use is extractive activities. So I'm not okay. really sure, but according to what I've read and heard, I'd say that exploration will probably be possible in this yeah. uh, in this area, yeah. which is yeah, really bad. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, sure. I think just to say something, because um, I we know that one of the issues in terms of the protected areas, as Ramon was saying, just speaking like in general terms, is that um, like one one technique that mining companies used. Uh, to sort of like navigate or sort of like to navigate and say, oh, our project is not gonna affect the protected area. Is that uh, they will say our project limits the protected area, but it's not gonna affect it. However, of course, that re reasoning, that doesn't make any sense because ecosystems, nature, they don't have borders, right? So yeah, like in theory on, a, on um, uh, um, in, uh, like, um, in theory, we could say that, yeah, the mining project is not going to reach the protected area, but as we know, watersheds, they go underground. Like all of these systems are interconnected, right? So that's one of the issues that we hear a lot from communities. Um, and this is not, as um, uh, Isabel was saying, it's, it's not only related to lithium mining, it, it goes to copper mining, gold mining. And we hear like, for example, in communities in Ecuador, um, a, how like a mining companies say, oh, like uh, it's not gonna be affected, but of course it's gonna be affected because everything is interconnected. And that's also one of the techniques that um, mining companies say that when they say only one community is gonna be affected, 
because all the communities are going to be affected one way or the other because everything is interconnected yeah i guess i'm repeating myself but i just it just that's the point that right that all ecosystems are connected and when something is affected when one watershed is affected all the watersheds are going to be affected yeah maybe i'll just hmm. didn't think the conversation would go here <laughs> i'm happy that it did I don't, admittedly, I don't know the, the happenings in Chile on, on this issue of protected areas very well. But again, if, if you're focusing the, the assessment at PDAC, that's another one of these environmental narratives and, and, and kind of um, themes that arises at PDAC is actually the mining sector's now involvement in various biodiversity conservation um, initiatives. And in some cases around the world, that has included the creation of new protected areas as a way to open, uh, as a way to help gain access to the mineral deposits somewhere else that they want. So again, this idea that like kind of offsetting the impact of the mine with the product, with the creation or establishment of a protected area in another ecosystem, right? Which of course, like if you think of the interconnectedness of ecosystems is pretty easy to, to, to challenge in terms of just a pure like uh, biodiversity, like a baseline function of how biodiversity oper like functions, right? Like one ecosystem is not the same as another ecosystem. So offsetting in this way doesn't really really work that well. Normally I show us when I talk about PDAC, I show a slide also of this uh, gold company, this Canadian gold company called B2 Gold. And they have this really flashy program where they've created these uh, rhino bars, rhino gold bars that they get their as, as their kind of biodiversity programming. They get their, they sell right to, to investors. They're really flashy. They're literally a gold bar and they claim to, to reinvest that those funds into various biodiversity programming programs at the local level, at the site level nearby their mines. So in the same way that the industry is involved in climate change responses, electrification, all of these types of things that we've been talking about tonight, uh, increasingly involved in the kind of biodiversity conservation realm as well. And I think actually in, in the case of, uh, Anyway, there was an interesting interview with President Trudeau and uh, the environmental minister in and around COP15, and they were talking about the critical mineral strategy and protected areas. And there was actually these hints that, you know, in the future, Canada may have to be kind of flexible in terms of being able to um, secure these critical mineral sites regardless of where they are. So there's kind of these like legal openings potentially in the future that that uh, might change what we think of a protected area <laughs> or, or create a different type of presentation. Great. Uh, we have a question from Afian. Um, is there any lobbying with the actual government against the lithium mining? Have they shown themselves open to hear the protests? Yeah, actually, we just uh, we're sharing uh, a Twitter. It's, it was also like a, 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 there is a, um, a publication on, also on the website about it. We I actually wrote something about it. Uh, the lack of uh, participation of uh, civil society and local communities in general in the discussion about uh, yeah, the, the national policy of lithium and especially about the possibility of the creation of this, uh, this company. So maybe you can see it in the chat and uh, that's pretty much our statement, our positioning. And, uh, and I think that also, um, I, I think it's Ariane, I think I know you from uh, Civil Society for Climate Action. Um, so mm -hmm. if it's you, <laughs> um, we were sharing some these, and uh, I, I remember I remember that there were some um, some responses uh, from uh, the network and uh, and uh, about this the the need actually of more participation. Unfortunately, 
and uh, and it's all contained in this uh, in, in this uh, in this piece like that you can check. But but in general, like the, the government actually uh, promised a lot of change and has a very progressive discourse. And um, I think that uh, they uh, what they're doing now is quite contradictory. And especially uh, regarding lithium, because they are uh, actually meeting like all uh, the mining companies that go to Chile. They've met even Elon Musk, uh, basically, uh, but they, they have like systematically ignored civil society organizations and people actually that uh, Marcelo Hernando, the Minister of Mining, know, uh, or Gonzalo Gutierrez, uh, the the assistant for non-metallic mining actually no, which is us and other organizations. Uh, so we are quite disappointed, but actually we really hope that at the government at some point we will hear uh, organizations like ours, not only us, for, of course, but organizations like ours that have like at least some, um, some knowledge based on uh, uh, first-hand experience and scientific experience and that uh, uh, local knowledge is actually that explain uh, and sustain our positioning on this. Um, maybe we could go with one last question from the chat here, except that there's maybe questions in the room. Was there a question in the back? All good? Okay, um, have you looked into Canadian government financial grants to countries of the global south that are actually financing Canadian mining projects? And that's from uh, Andres Larrea, a coworker of ours. If you have any insights on this question. Yeah. So I'll just repeat the question. Have you looked into Canadian government financial grants to countries of the global south that are actually financing Canadian mining projects? Um, yeah, no, I wouldn't be able to answer specifically grants, but we know that uh, mining companies get um, financial um, uh, contributions by the uh, by Export Canada, right? The EDC. Um, we know that, uh, we know, for example, I know that has been very well documented in the case of Chile, right? Of how uh, Canadian mining companies have gotten lots of uh, uh, financial aid by um, the Canadian government through the uh, uh, Exports uh, Canada. And um, this is uh, this is very, of course, very problematic in one way, as, uh, as we mentioned before, you know, all the uh, political and economic uh, support that uh, many companies get once they they want to uh, install a money project in a in a community. Um, we know that um, besides getting all of this financial aid um, at a in a very easy way, right? Everything is sort of like handed out to them. Uh, they pay very little taxes on that, right? And that's um, one of the myths that uh, as money watch Canada, we always try to um, uh, deconstruct and uh, analyze, right? Because there is this um, myth. Uh, or uh, thinking that uh, mining companies, uh, because they make so much money, uh, billions and billions in profit, uh, they may pay, they may be paying a lot of taxes in Canada, right? So that uh, that's why uh, is is good for Canada to have mining companies because they are contributing to the economy. However, when you go deep into the numbers, you first you see that they are getting a lot of economic uh, and financial uh, uh, aid, and on the other hand. They are not paying as much as they're uh, profit profiting uh, from, right? Uh, so um, again, I don't have any specific numbers about grants, but that's uh, you know that financial aid is very is very well uh, documented. Maybe just a little. Uh, um, what we actually we mentioned this on the report is how actually the Canadian embassy actually has been actually working uh, in relations. Uh, with communities, actually, uh, 
during, I, I remember that at the time uh, that we were writing this report right before the pandemic, they were visiting communities in Atacama Soul Flat. They were visiting and asking the communities for meetings um, in, the, in Maricunga, for example, where they know that Canadian companies are trying actually to establish and to get concessions and, you know. So uh, maybe not through grants like to explore, I wouldn't. I wouldn't say that. At least, what, as far I know. But, but, um, but there is like a diplomatic actually work and effort, definitely, uh, on that direction. And um, we also detected and found also local NGOs, especially human rights NGOs, that work uh, with uh, grants uh, given by uh, by the Canadian Embassy in Chile, which which is also very problematic, actually. Uh, so what they do is basically do like uh, organize some workshops and they always come with some, um, you know, uh, aggregates from the Canadian government. So it's also like a very, um, you know, uh, I'd say sophisticated uh, strategy to get to know the territories. At the end of the day, also the, these NGOs, actually, they have to do. Um, provide some reporting or something, you know, so there is a lot of information that is flowing uh, to the hands of the, the government. And as we know, government and corporations work together. So I think that's also quite problematic. I, I, we mentioned that in the report. Um, yeah, thanks. Thank you very much for the presentation, for all of you, and also uh, for the lectures now. I'm glad that we're not to, uh, to uh, about this because that was my question after the sorry the beginning. Uh, I wanted to know if you explore the link between global affairs Canada, which part of global affairs Canada is responsible for and that's the uh Yeah, so yeah. So uh, I was wondering uh, the role that Global Affairs Canada has because um, they have this development part in it. They have this, uh, they have development programs to uh, quote unquote go and help the underdeveloped world. And I was just going to repeat what you, what you asked. Uh, Hi, because no, the, the microphone is here. There, like, no, no. no. Okay, just a second. Someone is coming to ask a question. Um, I'm confused a little bit. Okay, so thank you very much for uh, your answer. And Ramon, I'm very happy that uh, you you talked about the role of uh, Canadian embassies. Uh, what I wanted to know is the role of Global Affairs Canada, uh, because um, it, it used to be that uh, CEDA, merged with uh, external affairs, something like that. They merge together and there's a commercial part and external affairs, and then there's the development part. And um, the role of, um, uh, very often, it seems that the role of uh, Canadian development projects in the Global South are merged with the role of, um, you know what I wanted to say, but I had several concussions, so I'm a little bit confused. So the role of, uh, uh, mining yeah, mining industry. So it, it looks like they um, they can get to certain populations, like you were saying with the NGOs, uh, under perhaps the disguise of development programs, and uh, that way they can. So I, I was wondering. I gather that you probably investigated this type of thing and maybe you could uh, talk about this. Um, uh, yeah, so we've looked into it, uh, but I, uh, and as many watch, but I also have some experience uh, because of working with uh, Canadian um, uh, volunteer organizations that go to the global south. Uh, to do development uh, uh, projects, uh, uh, women's uh, projects, right? Uh, uh, women's rights projects. And one thing that we've seen is that um, 
one of the strat one of the strategies that the Canadian government uses in order to sort of like whitewash their image uh, in in countries as, such as Chile, Bolivia, Peru, uh, Ecuador, is that they send volunteers, for example, into these projects. And they do, let's say that, yeah, those projects are, are good, right? There's no, sometimes there's nothing uh, to, that we have to criticize about those projects. However, they put a lot of money into that in order to present those projects and to show these uh, friendly, uh, um, uh, a face to the country, right? So they will, you know, so the the Canadian embassies do a lot of work of promoting those uh, those projects within the country. However, when it comes, you know, these allegations against uh, Canadian mining companies and you know human rights violations, uh, contamination that gets downplayed, and what it gets, you know, um, highlighted is this good job that uh, Canadian uh, NGOs are doing in the, in, the, in the country. So we see that as a way of whitewashing and greenwashing also uh, Canadian behavior, Canadian mining companies behavior in those uh, countries. So I'm not sure if that answers your question. Well, it does partly, but I was trying to, I would uh, see uh, more of the role of the Canada yeah. because they have, Government that actually Yeah, actually, um, when uh, in 2020, um, I, I met actually people from Global Affairs uh, with Kirsten. Actually, we had a, a meeting at PIDAC. So he, uh, she uh, managed like uh, to get this meeting and. Um, so uh, yeah, so so it's uh, quite complicated because. Um, I don't know about specific projects or specific funding, but it's very clear that they have their agenda. Um, they heard what, what Kirsten and I had to say. Kirsten, uh, by the way, working at that time with uh, my name coach Canada, right? Um, so she was part also of, of, of my activities that, that I had in, in Canada. Uh, she was organizing or helping me to organize that. So basically, um, we realized that uh, they were just um, commanded, kind of. Like for them, uh, actually, what they said is like, okay, we want to hear what you what you have to say, but this is like bigger than us, you know. I don't know about specific projects or funding. I think actually that the question is very interesting, and that's actually what these spaces are good for. Uh, because maybe we could actually like search a little bit more and see what, what they are actually doing now. Uh, at that time, um, what I was trying to, to explain was like part of this presentation uh, about the conflicts in Atacama and how Canadian companies wanted to enter this software, right? What, what, they wanted to, what, what they wanted to do is actually just uh, to say that they had like uh, all the... The, um, they were super open actually to listen to organizations and to people, but there was nothing that they could do actually basically to change anything on the diplomatic agenda um, because of what, of what we've been talking about right now, actually. As you see, like the, state, the, the minerals, the transition minerals is something much bigger actually than many of the specific departments of the government. But thank you for the question because I think that we we we, we should definitely actually uh, try to dive a little bit well, deeper into that. that. Is that maybe you could look into the history of what went on twenty years ago with CEDA? Uh, yeah. And yeah. We'll get answers. Definitely. There are yeah. there are. A Thanks few for the suggestion. From, it's not even. I think it's twenty fifteen. I, I want to say. I mean. Oh yeah, but this is like a history like. But there's a direct, there's direct links between with CETA at the time uh, and their development aid programs in, in direct partnership with Barrett Gold at the time. Hmm. And it, if my memory serves, part of the reason that they changed that they merged global affairs was because of the pushback yeah. that they received on those types of and it's that, 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 that yeah. 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 there was there was two or three they projects that were together. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Just thank you. That's, so it's, yeah. It's certainly there. Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much for the question. I think it helps us uh, 
look through different links uh, between uh, different actors in the um, extractive world, uh, Canadian and uh, worldwide. Uh, so thank you very much, uh, everyone, for being here, for coming. Uh, I want to thank uh, every author of uh, this report that is public. Anyone can uh, access it. It's, it's very good. I, I read it a few times. Uh, so uh, Ramon, Devin, Viviana, and uh, Cristian Flores. Um, Flores. Yeah, exactly. I would like to thank uh, Fundacion Tanti, I would like to thank uh, Le Centre R, um, Le Centre de Recherche en Éducation et Formation Relative à l'Environnement et à l'Éco-Citoyenneté. I would like to thank Le Projet Résiste Action, Dimension Critique et Politique de l'Éducation Relative à l'Environnement en Contexte de Conflits Socio-Écologiques et leur rapport à l'émergence d'alternatives. I would like to thank uh, Mining Watch Canada. I would like to thank Beyond Extraction. And uh, Observatorio Plurinacional de Salares Andinos, el, the UPSAL. Um, thank you, uh, Nicole. Uh, thank you, Javiera. Um, and thank you, Terence, for helping with the tech at the beginning. Um, thank you. I don't know if I forgot anyone. Um, yeah, well, thank you very much for uh, attending this forum. And uh, thank you. That's next it. Time. Yeah, next time. <laughs>